Hi, I'm Rob Rutenbar. I'm the Senior Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of Pittsburgh and happy today to be able to have a conversation with Pat Gallagher, the Chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh, my boss, about the success of the research enterprise at Pitt. So, Pat, thanks so much for being able to be here. Glad to be here. So, I thought we might start with a with a with a short conversation about how you and I and our jobs intersect. So, you've been here for about nine years. I've been here for about six years. One difference, but maybe the bigger difference is that your job existed before you got here. <laughs> you were the 18th chancellor, a long line of chancellors, but I'm the first senior vice chancellor for research. In fact, the office of the senior vice chancellor for research didn't exist. And the notion of research as something at the senior leadership level of the institution did not exist before you got here. So very grateful that you created this position. I thought we might start with just a conversation about how did that come about? I thought you were going to criticize me for why it took three years to get there. But, um, well, you know, in some ways it was more of a surprise that Pitt did not have a central uh, senior point uh, for our research enterprise, right? We were a significant uh, research performer, one of the largest in the country. We were growing quickly. And that office, in my view, has always had sort of two primary functions. One is offensive and one is defensive. Uh, one is to promote the research activities and give uh, research faculty across the university kind of a home base for innovation and new tools and things that advance uh, their research work, since the faculty do the research work of the university. And the second one was compliance and making sure the conduct of research didn't create obstacles that were unaddressed. So, you know, having those dispersed across the university, which they were for the first three years, was a complication on a couple of fronts. One was I didn't have a partner. Um, at the senior level, I didn't have one person to go to. So any issues it quickly became, you know, assembling a committee or a group. And I, I certainly felt that was a loss. Um, and the second reason really had to do with the fact uh, that no one was driving and championing any change. Um, it, it tended to keep us in patterns that were familiar to us, maintaining status quo. And not that many of those were bad. We were obviously doing okay, but we were not going to see the kind of innovation and new steps that were needed. So, you know, I felt it was really important to, you know, create a senior position that reported to me that was responsible for that sort of twin offense and defensive mission, supporting, you know, what is a very considerable research enterprise and, you know, big fringe benefit that came out of it, Rob, was you. I'm grateful for the vision. Also, personally happy to have had the opportunity to come back to Pittsburgh, which I think is the, the best city anywhere. So. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about sort of consequences of the success of the research enterprise at scale. One of the things that you would expect, you know, as a consequence of that much successful scholarship, that much successful science is, is the opportunity for Pitt to emerge as an anchor institution on a broader landscape of impact, uh, translation, commercialization, startups, entrepreneurship. Uh, the same role Stanford plays in the in the Bay, or the same role that uh, the pair of Harvard and MIT play in in Boston. And you and I have had an enormous number of conversations about about Pitt as an anchor for the health sciences, in particular, a life sciences corridor. So, can you talk a little bit about about the, the sort of the the thinking around the life sciences corridor vision? Yeah, I you know going back to your first point though, I think you know you do research for a reason. Uh, the country funds research for a reason, and that is that research leads to new ideas, new products, new services, new ways of thinking of problems, and it provides solutions. So sometimes we can get lost a little bit in the churn of the research process, and we can start looking for those intermediate definitions of success, you know, our papers, our publications, our rankings. By the way, those are all important because they're quality indicators. And what was very clear to me coming to the University of Pittsburgh was that uh, our research enterprise was of extraordinary quality. But it wasn't as focused on the outcomes of that work. We seemed to uh, go to a certain point and then consider it done. And I think that's uh, where it really gets interesting because it moves you closer to the funding agencies and what they're interested in doing. And also, and I hope we get a chance to talk about this, it drives important types of innovation and uh, collaboration that can occur when you're focused on the problem. But for us, you know, the the dominant 
uh, research area is certainly in the medical and health sciences. It seemed obvious that should be our biggest area of research-related impact. And if you look at you know our work, I think there were a couple of areas where that really stood out. One is you know clinical care and healthcare, and can you drive and make meaningful changes in the way you know disease and and health are treated, or even more importantly. Uh, can you address the core problem of what is wellness and how to support it so that we don't get sick in the first place? So the whole outcomes um, from a clinical side, very important. But the other thing is, you know, healthcare is the, one of the largest uh, sectors of our economy. And um, in, the, in the business of providing healthcare and doing all that, you are a major economic driver, or you should be. And I think I told you at one point, you know, when you were coming here, I said, what's interesting about Pittsburgh, when you go through a lot of uh, campuses, you drive through a business district as you approach the campus of all the companies that are trying to be you know, one cup of coffee away from campus. And here you just land in Oakland. You didn't go through a business district like that. And that was kind of a sign that we had a lot more to do. And the, the idea behind the life science corridor is really an idea of place. Can you create that zone? that mixing zone, if you will, between the corporate commercial businesses that are using the kind of intellectual capital and, and ideas that come from a university and do it right alongside the people in the university so that there's a back and forth. That's when the magic happens. And many of the ecosystems that we talk about uh, that are famous, like Stanford, that's really what they've achieved is this kind of um, enterprise. And, you know, you'll recall the Brookings Institute did a, a major study here. And that was really one of their key findings is we were missing those places uh, where that shoulder rubbing can happen. One of the things that's interesting about Pitt is the size of the research enterprise. So reliably top 20 in volume, reliably top 10 frequently, top five in the size of the NIH investment at campus scale, which includes not just the health sciences, but engineering and chemistry and biology and social work and education even. But the other thing that's interesting about the research enterprise at Pitt is the shape of the, of the research enterprise, which is extremely dominated by single investigator awards. So on the health sciences side, the famous R01, sort of the, the thing you do to become successful in the medical enterprise is to score an R01 from NIH and similarly across all the all the other all the other kinds of kinds of funding. And the analogy I always use is that if we were a baseball team, the way we got to the World Series is we get on first base more than anybody else, fabulously successfully. But there's more to winning the World Series than getting on first base. There are there are doubles and home runs, which which leads to the conversations you and I have had about enhancing and growing and accelerating a culture of team science, which is where many of the federal funding agencies are heading. So talk, talk a little bit about your, you know, your thinking on the teams. You know, it's interesting. There's nothing wrong with single investigator research, right? It's, uh, it's important. Uh, um, we got successful. It's how you get successful. It certainly, from an academic perspective, is very useful because the way we train students, it, it lends itself to the way we're organized internally. But it's not the only way of doing science. And not every problem is of the size that it can be done by one person on interesting questions. So doing larger scale science in some form of collaboration, teams, centers, institutes, these constructs are all designed to create the environment where multiple scientists, by the way, most interesting cases are from different fields, are being brought together to work collaboratively uh, on a shared problem or challenge. And, and that's often some of the most creative and, you know, uh, promising work that happens because of the, that intense collaborative environment. The ideas start flowing and all sorts of creative outcomes happen. It was very clear, and, and as you said, you and I did look at this a lot, that we were not doing enough of that. And, and that raised sort of a question, why? You know, either we didn't value it, and the reward system of the university just didn't appreciate the value of working together, or we had too much sand in the gears. There was just too much friction uh, and things were getting in the way of collaboration. I always felt it was the second one because one of the things you hear when you walk across campus is, this is an easy place to work with other people. So we didn't seem to have the territorial culture that some universities have where it's difficult to collaborate, where the incentives aren't there. I think people here generally wanted to, 
but it got lost somewhere in, in execution. Um, and so I think one of the real achievements that you, know, you and your team have brought to bear is how do you sort of begin to unpack those issues that were getting in our way? Um, and that can be very trivial behind the scenes thing, like you know how does money get shared and things like that, up to more exciting things like uh, you know shared research tools and facilities and other things that um, bring things together. The one area that I think was so innovative was recognizing that there's a whole skill set that comes to working with teams. In other words, when you're collaborating and doing research with the team, part of your effort is managing the team dynamics. Uh, and so there's organizational skills and capabilities and org charts and and, uh, and even proposal writing. And I think uh, putting in the combination of um, the boot camps uh, where you brought interested faculty together and the momentum funds, which really were designed to provide that kind of angel funding, that sort of lowering the risk uh, to really help teams figure out how to operate as a team has been a game changer. I have to say that the the big proposal boot camp initiative that that, that my shop did has been one of the most satisfying and most fun things that we that we've done uh, because the the big secret sauce there is demystifying the the team, which is they're not different than you are. They just have a, some skill sets and they just have they have they have a utility second baseman and you don't, right? You're not supposed to know how to do that. But you're supposed to know that somebody else at Pitt knows how to do that, and and you know, and can and can put that together. Let's 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 keep on the on the topic of the incentives. One of the interesting things that you tasked me and Anne with, a few years after you after you got here, was to try to bring some order to and some more oomph to uh, the investment ecosystem around 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 new research. And that is literally where the where the momentum funds came from when I got here. There was a plethora of disconnected funding ecosystems. One of the things we did was we brought them together in three ramps, a, um, a seed ramp. Let's get started with a new idea. That's a very cool new idea. Here's some money. Go do it. A teaming thing, which was new for Pitt. Um, you don't know how to talk to those people on the other side of campus. Here are some resources. Go, go, go figure it out. And scaling, that's a fabulous idea. It's going to take you two years to put the collateral together to write that gigantic proposal, how do you think we're doing? How do you think the momentum funds has sort of changed things? Well, based on the zero to 60 kind of, I think yeah. it's a huge success. The signs of progress from those that have benefited from these programs who have gone through the boot camp and have received those funds, and it's not the funding, it's what the funding enabled. Um, it's those collaborations and those milestones that those funding sort of promote. For me, that's been incredible because not only do you see the, oh, I need these skills and these capabilities to be able to operate at scale, to be able to collaborate, but for me, the most exciting thing is for those that have gone through those programs, when they start to think bigger, you can just see that it's opening up new horizons. And it's incredibly exciting to see the, the, you know, the light in the eyes uh, as these teams realize that you know what's opened up is not just being bigger, but being able to tackle different things. Some problems are just require teams and you're, you're suddenly accessing a whole new level of problems that you can go after. And that's really stimulating and it's exciting to people. Um, and I think the idea of collaborating on something shared is incredibly exciting and realizing very quickly what others bring to the team. So on that side, it's been really um, a game changer. I think our challenge is that we're still predominantly a single investigator uh, world. And while it's great, you know, to have had folks go through that, the question now is how do you build sort of a lasting culture uh, where this is accepted? And there's now a, a large number of people who've been there and done that and could be internal resources for those. So scaling this up itself, uh, it's almost like we need our own momentum program for the momentum program, right? So we've gone through the seed phase and now we're in the scale and phase. I think that's really important because that's where you build in the sort of collective, that's the way Pitt does things. Yeah. And that um, that combination of belief and capability and people who have done it, right? That experience base, that's what really starts to uh, change things uh, in a really exciting uh, way. So I think that's our next step. Um, and, uh, I think we're ready to take it. 
I'll note that one of the cool things is that we now have multiple cohorts of people who've been through Big Proposal Boot Camp. So we have assistant professors who are grizzled veterans because they were in this, they were in this three years ago, uh, who we can now turn to as, as, as mentors and as reviewers and as, and as helpers. So that's actually a, one of the other tremendously satisfying things. Well, you, of this. you're an entrepreneur, right? So you yep. started a company. You know that this is true in that side too. So there's nothing that's more valued in that arena than people have tried to start a company. Doesn't matter whether it was successful or not. In fact, sometimes they learn more from the ones that weren't but you only learn by doing. And I think the same thing is true for some of the team and, and uh, you know, collective science, that we're now building up a community within the university. Successful or not, they've, they've gone out there and they've tried to do it. And they now have skills, uh, expertise, and a passion for it that I think is contagious and uh, will serve as well. And so that's a beautiful segue into another, another conversation about collaboration. So there's there's one sort of collaboration that I think many of us are most familiar with, which is academic to academic, and that's academic to academic inside the institution. And then if you're a little braver, a little higher risk tolerance, academic to academic in another institution, but there's a whole other landscape of collaborations uh, in, in industrial collaborations, collaborations with government labs, collaborations with things that don't have a .edu as the end of their, as the end of their email. And one of the things that that you've done throughout your career, both here and in, in your, you know, your previous your previous gigs, uh, strengthening collaborations among higher industry, among government actors, among, among, among industry. In fact, one of the things you did about a year ago, you led an APLU study, right? Uh, driving U.S. competitiveness through improved university industry participation uh, partnerships. When you chaired the APLU's Commission on Economic and Community Engagement, it's called CC. Can you talk a little bit about the CC study? Because that was, that was a big, uh, interesting team and you know, basically doing that doing that that uh, that data dive my shop was involved in doing doing some of the data dives you talk talk about the CC study if you will well the CC study was built around an idea that is kind of obvious when you state it um, which is that even this big team science we've been talking about the academic to academic is still a minority fraction of the total amount of R&D that's done in a country including the United States in fact, in the United States, you know, almost three quarters of the R and D is done by industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our university part is a is a small piece of that pie, and that basically leads you to believe that you know the real impact comes from partnering outside of universities. You have to do that, and and I think that's in its broadest sense. I think that's collaboration with communities, with governments, with nonprofits, but the largest R and D performer in our country are companies. Where I give us an A plus is really building our capability with the youngest companies, the whole entrepreneurship mm -hmm. side where the companies that come right out of our research, often founded by faculty, mm -hmm. um, we're doing so much better in that space. And I think that's great news because those are the, f the high growth success companies where a lot of magic happens in those early phases. But when you look at the R&D activity, they're not the major players. The big players are the big companies. That's where the lion's share of that is done. And I think we have a lot more to do there. And it's just like the team-based science, working with a company, uh, even if it's a research team on a company, is different from working with your colleagues in the university or even at another university. It's a different culture, it's a different mindset, different funding mechanisms, different tools. And, um, we can do a lot more in that space than we're doing. Um, the good news is that you don't have to sell your soul to do that. You don't have to become the company. You can still be the university. And what you bring to them when you do that is all the advantages that the university can offer. It's talent, it's students, it's freedom to explore, including areas that may not be you know, tied to the specific trajectory of the technology. But you also get uh, a rich a source of very interesting problems uh, and you get access to their talent in some cases the, through global networks and so I, d I think that's an area where uh, you know our efforts to expand again relationships all partnerships are relationships and form that mixing zone where companies and universities can safely mm -hmm. uh, and safely I mean uh, work together true to their own cultures um, where the whole is kind of greater than the sum of the parts. I will admit that I say this all the time, that I learned at least half of what I know, to the extent that I know anything about management by being in a bunch of startup companies, because nothing focuses the mind like the knowledge that if you don't make the decision properly, somebody is not going to be able to pay their mortgage 
next month. So it's a very it's a, it's a remarkably intense um, kind of kind of activity. I'll I'll note that the Innovation Institute, which is where we sort of um, support most of that activity, predates your arrival by 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 just one year, and we we appreciate the, the tremendous amount of support that you've you know you've given the you know the um, the entire activity around 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 inv innovation and entrepreneurship. Okay, um, a, a final question. Word on the street is you're going to go back and be a physicist, right? Moving moving forward, and I have been, um, I think, enormously privileged um, uh, um, in in uh, being able to have conversations with you about I think a, a topic of, of of mutual interest, which is quantum quantum information science, quantum mechanics. Um, I have I have said this. Uh, with very little um, exaggeration, I appreciate the fact that I am the second most knowledgeable guy on the senior leadership team about quantum mechanics. We're going to see what happens in the next in the next regime. One of the things that's spectacular is you just this week signed off on um, a large institutional investment and commitment in a quantum information lab. Talk about what quantum means. Right for all of us, right in in STEM, and what it might mean from Pitt for you, from your particular perch, you know, as a real a real life physicist and someone from NIST who was a significant investor in that activity before you got here. Well, I am excited about signing off on our strategic um, uh, investment in quantum, but it, it ironically it has very little to do with my physics. Quantum mechanics was a revolution in thought in how things work at most fundamental level, particularly uh, at the microscopic level. And of course, it's surprising because things don't operate like that at our scale. And that's where, um, you know, it's both challenging for students to learn that field, but it also is really interesting because it means if you could exploit those unusual features, it opens up a new horizon. So the scientist in me gets excited whenever something is fundamentally opened up a new way of thinking, or in, in this case, a new set of tools for manipulating and controlling things, exploiting this quantum mechanics. And the reason I say it's not about physics, the exciting thing about this is that it's now team-based science. Uh, it takes engineers, physicists, and all the apl application areas, computer science, uh, life sciences, and the, the the universities that are going to thrive in this environment are those that can operate at scale. Uh, and so we had to make some strategic decisions about, you know, we're willing to play at that scale and we're willing to put uh, the resources into the faculty lines, into the collaboration, into the research tools and facilities that will be needed uh, to thrive. And it was a, an easy decision in some ways because Pitt had always had a very strong, uh, underappreciated, but very strong presence in quantum-based uh, measurement uh, and devices. And uh, this was a chance to sort of build on that um, foundation and take it to new places. So pretty exciting. I agree. Uh, this is going to be super exciting. And you have a, a uh, an entire cohort of uh, physicists, basic scientists, uh, engineers, and computer scientists who are all holding their breath, waiting, waiting for uh, some interesting equipment to arrive in loading docks for us to get going. So... Well, with that, thank you, Pat. Enjoy, Rob, and thank you for all that you've done to advance uh, our research, but more importantly, all of our amazing pet researchers. Thank you.